Um, can I welcome you all um, to uh, this seminar um, in our series uh, marking uh, 10 years? Uh, so just, I just had a message saying you can hear me, um, which is good. Uh, so welcome to our, our, our seminar in our series marking uh, 10 years uh, since the Equality Act. Um, and, and today um, we're going to be asking uh, the question, among other things, whether the failure uh, to enact um, Section 1 of the Socioeconomic Duty in the Equality Act was a great missed opportunity. More broadly, um, how class or socioeconomic disadvantage uh, can be addressed in a discrimination framework and what options are available under the current law. And we've got two excellently qualified speakers. Uh, Jamie Burton is going to go first, is the head of our community care and health team. Uh, he's also uh, chair and co-founder of Just Fair, a registered charity uh, that particularly uh, is concerned with economic, social and cultural rights. He represents Just Fair at the UN um, and the uh, charity has uh, produced a number of landmark reports on, on housing, on food poverty and disability. Um, and, and he's going to speak about uh, class discrimination and socioeconomic disadvantage. Uh, Eulalie Burnham um, is the head of our uh, community care, uh, uh, of our, our quarter protection team, uh, and, and she's now currently predominantly a mental health and uh, quarter protection practitioner. Uh, she's also got huge experience um, in, in equality law um, and was chair of the Discrimination Law Association. Uh, particularly um, at the point uh, when the Equality Act was going through Parliament and she was involved in a lot of consultation responses about socioeconomic duty and multiple discrimination. Uh, and so she's going to focus on intersectionality. Um, there, there's a, it, it's a huge topic and, and there's um, a, a lot to get through. Uh, and between them, uh, Jamie and uh, you lady are probably going to continue for about an hour. Um, and uh, it, will then take questions at the end of both of their um, talks. Um, if you've got something that uh, occurs to you um, in, in the course of uh, their um, presentations, then uh, please use the, the Q&A function at the, at the top of the screen, uh, and I'll come to that um, at, at the end of those presentations. So uh, if I can now pass on to Jamie. Thank you very much, Martin, um, and thank you for that. Nice introduction. I think it's fair to say that Eulalie and I, when talking about this topic, which we're very excited to be talking to you about, um, realised that there really is so much that could potentially be said about this very important issue about how we deal with class in the context of discrimination law, that we couldn't possibly do it justice in this short session that we're going to have this afternoon. So we have, in fact, really already decided to do something next year that will be a bit grander, a bit longer, and most importantly, will involve other people whose opinions will doubtless be uh, better informed, certainly equally informed as ours, uh, and uh, will doubtless also involve uh, consideration of some of the potential conflicts that this issue gives rise to, because it's not straightforward, I think it's fair to say. Um, I I've started here with this quote from Leonard Cohen, which, which I freely accept ordinarily might be considered a bit pretentious, but I make no apologies for it. Um, because he's, he, he was indeed a great poet. And I think just in this four lines, he really caught the essence of, of the issue and the reason really why we're talking about this. Um, there's also another reason why I wanted to use this quote, but I'll explain that later on. But it's particularly in those highlighted words that everybody knows the fight was fixed. The poor stay poor, the rich get rich. That's how it goes, everybody knows. Because the essence really of discrimination to some extent is the inherent injustice in treating people uh, in ways which are not in any way merited and for arbitrary reasons or reasons related to historical prejudice and disadvantage. And so the big question really here is, is how does that sort of analysis work in the context of poverty, socioeconomic disadvantage and class? Uh, unfortunately, I'm using uh, an iPad today, which means I can't move the slides on myself. So everybody's going to have to put up with me occasionally saying to our um, great administrator and assistant Ray to change the slides. So the first one um, is a slide taken from uh, Professor Philip Alston's report uh, when he uh, finished his mission to the UK in 2018. And there are a couple of slides here I'm going to go through very quickly, but really just to get across one point, which is that even from the perspective of a human rights practitioner rather than a politician or somebody who's pursuing a political ideology, 
the situation in Britain looks pretty bleak, particularly when one takes into account events that took place after the global financial crisis in 2007-8, uh, leading up to COVID. And of course, Philip Alston's report was written pre-COVID, and we all know what that's done to pre-existing inequalities and discrimination. But the essence of the point that's being made here by Professor Alston is that there is a residual category of uh, person in the UK who is persistently subjected to poverty and all the adverse consequences that flow from that. And moreover, um, that um, group of people is increasing in size so that we have more 4 million uh, people who are uh, more than 50% below the poverty line and one and a half million people who've experienced destitution in 2017, i.e. unable to afford basic essentials. And then the really startling and, and frightening statistic really about what's happening to child poverty rates and the prediction, again, pre-COVID, that almost one in every two children would effectively be poor in a relative sense in 21st century Britain which Professor Alston uh, found himself compelled to say that this was not only a disgrace, but a social calamity and an economic disaster rolled into one. And Ray, if we could just move on, uh, I'm just gonna skip through these very quickly, uh, making the points there highlighted, that even statistics don't really capture the full extent of this picture. And it's obvious to anybody who's been living here in recent years, what's been happening to our levels of social deprivation, what's been happening to poor people because of government policies, et cetera. Um, and we've seen that in, in big indicators like use of food banks, homelessness, life expectancy going down in some instances. And also this important point about the extent to which government reforms have contributed to this outcome in particular, uh, and how that's impacted on certain people who share certain protected characteristics such as sex or disability. But then just moving on to the next slide, um, he, he, we have Professor Olson's conclusion that the bottom line is that much of the glue that has held British society together since the Second World War has been deliberately removed and replaced with a harsh and uncaring ethos. Now, the essence, it seems to me, at that point is there's been somewhat of a dismantling of the systems in place introduced by government to try and avoid uh, the disadvantages that are associated uh, with socioeconomic status um, prevailing, i.e. steps taken to try and mitigate and limit that harm. But yet we've seen uh, this great, as he says, um, sort of unwinding, as it were, uh, of those systems and those structures. And that's created or at least added to the pressure um, to consider whether or not we need to be thinking about poverty as a form of discrimination. Ray, can we just move on to the next slide, please? So there are another couple of or, or sort of indicators why now is the time to be thinking about this. As I've already said, the living standards of the lowest income groups have declined consistently since 2010. And there's been uh, innumerable, innumerous reports about that, setting out that case and the reasons why. Uh, as the TUC found in its 2019 report, um, prejudice in the job market is now rife. I mean, one, one statistic is, for example, that people who come, graduates who come from working class backgrounds are disproportionately uh, less likely to be in high earning jobs and on average earn less than their middle class counterparts, even when they have a better degree. And there's also been a significant decline in social mobility to the point where there, there is barely any, and even the Social Mobility Commission in 2019 has stressed that urgent action is necessary. And you may remember uh, that Mr. Milburn, the previous um, social mobility czar actually resigned during the currency of uh, the previous administration, Bar one, the coalition government, because of the failure to take any steps to address declining social mobility. We've also seen at the same time as all of this uh, uh, legislative change and the rowing back of the welfare state, et cetera, this increase in stigmatization and sort of anti-poverty anti culture or poverty porn as it's sometimes described or chav culture, which has also been leading to kind of these big uh, 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 um, symbols of segregation. I mean, some of you may remember, for example, the controversy surrounding the um, residential building developments where there were two doors, one door that people who had bought their flats privately were allowed to go to and another door for the people who were living in the um, socially rented flats that were of course being mandated by the state as a necessary condition of doing the development. And that type of thing 
uh, it's just an indicator, at least, at least in my view, of how the culture around these issues has changed so significantly in recent years. And then, of course, and it seems completely inappropriate to only give it one line, we have COVID and indeed the response to it, which has exacerbated, as we all know, and indeed exposed uh, these pre-existing inequalities in a very dramatic way. Ray, could we? Thank you. So what's the problem and why are we talking about it here? Well, the obvious one is that anti-discrimination norms have not traditionally been directly concerned with socioeconomic disadvantage. The status-based grounds have evolved to include, as we know, race, sex, disability, sexual orientation, religion, etc. And many of these groups have been historically disadvantaged from a socioeconomic perspective, often as a consequence of the prejudice and stigma attached to those status-based characteristics. But the goal of anti-discrimination provisions was not to directly address the socioeconomic disadvantage itself. And also, although being of a lower economic status is not a, as it were, personal or cultural trait, necessarily anyway, it can function as such when poorness is constructed as a category and people belonging to it or perceived to belong to it uh, are ascribed a series of negative traits, a form of stigmatization, as we say. And that is reinforced by, of course, particularly in the UK, all the social and cultural issues that associate with the question of class. Right, could we? So very, very briefly, uh, on the international law plane, some of this has been understood for a very long time. All the key international covenants actually forbid discrimination on the basis of social origin. Right, I've just had a, a, a message come up about the slides not being visible. I don't know if that's something that's extending beyond particular person raising question, I hope not. Um, if that is the case, don't worry too much, you, you haven't missed very, very much. Hopefully we'll get the slides back on in due course. Um, so the, the only simple point I really want to make here is that the idea of discrimination being outlawed where based on social origin, which is a terminology used, is very familiar to international law. And we, I've, I've listed all the different um, international covenants and conventions there that make that provision. And I've highlighted one, of course, which is Article 14 of European Convention of Human Rights. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, but as I say, international law uh, uh, provides for this. And we've even seen very limited, admittedly, uh, jurisprudence around this, particularly the Human Rights Committee in the Mellon Island case, for example, uh, made it very clear that it thought the discrimination that had been inflicted to Ms. Mellon, who wasn't entitled to uh, wasn't paid effectively to, to uh, sorry, let me rephrase that, wasn't uh, the cost of her coming to the, um, to, to the UK to have an abortion were not covered by the Irish government. Uh, and it was said that that decision had failed to adequately take into account her medical needs and her socioeconomic circumstances. And therefore they found a violation of Article 26, which is the non-discrimination clause on two grounds gender discrimination and socioeconomic status. But it's fair to say that even on the international plane, examples are, 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 are few and far between. Now, just changing slide again, the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in its general comment number 20 has also said something about non-discrimination non in this context. And the only point I want to draw here is that the general comment recognizes that um, there may be, as it were, two different ways in which somebody might be discriminated against, or at least two different uh, reasons, two different ways of, of um, uh, defining the class itself. One is by reference to social origin, uh, and that's again the one I've said is already set out in the international covenants and, and conventions. And the general comment defines that as referring to a person's inherited social status. But then under the um, general heading of other status, which of course we also see in Article 14 of European Convention. Um, the general comment goes on to explain that that would also cover people who are in a particular economic or social group who are arbitrarily treated because of being a member of that group. And so there it's identified that it's either about having the inherited social status or it's about current material conditions uh, being the basis upon which discrimination occurs. So Ray, just moving on again, please. Uh, and that's also reflected to some extent in the UN's guiding principles on extreme poverty, but we'll move on from that now because of pressures of time. Now, what has the European Court of Human Rights said about this? Well, ultimately very little, but it is interesting to look at the case of Garib in the Netherlands just very quickly. Uh, Mrs. Garib uh, lived in accommodation that she rented with her two children. She was a single parent and her landlord wished to renovate the property she was living in and 
offered her a tenancy of a property just a couple of streets away. However, the local municipality denied her a permit to reside in that property because she didn't meet the requirements of the Inner City Problems Special Measures Act, uh, which is, uh, 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 of all the acts I've come across, one of the most <laughs> terrifyingly named. Um, but the point here was that there was an income threshold that was applied by this act, which the municipality said prevented them from granting uh, Miss Garib a uh, right to reside in this accommodation that was offered to her because she essentially didn't all, uh, uh, earn enough. And the court, uh, then and that argument was run not under Article 14, it has to be said, although Miss Garib had run a discrimination argument through the domestic courts, but through Article 2, Protocol 4, which is the freedom to choose one's residence, which of course is a right which is qualified and can be justified where it's necessary in a democratic society to do so. And by a majority of 12 to 5, the European Court found that the treatment of Mrs. Garrett was not unlawful. That was because this terribly named act sought to address increasing social problems in, in, in inner city areas of Rotterdam by favoring new residents whose income was related to gainful economic activity of their own and was therefore deemed necessary in a democratic society. So favoring new residents over existing residents uh, simply because um, they earned more. Now this case is all about the dissenting judgment of uh, Judge Pinto de Albuquerque, who gives a, a barnstorming dissent. Um, and I just actually invite everybody to read that paragraph 22, because it seems to me it's an important recognition, albeit by a minority judgment, about the state of play. Most importantly, it seems to me, uh, Judge Pinto de Albuquerque recognizes what the real issue in the case is, which is discrimination against individuals on account of their socially precarious situations. And he considered the court to be presented with an opportunity to take a position on a social phenomenon, as he described it, which is continually growing. While the world has seen unprecedented economic growth, wealth gaps have become intolerable and the living conditions of precarious groups represent more than ever a breach of human dignity. In those circumstances, the most underprivileged suffer from a latent discrimination, which is both the cause and the consequence of their poverty. And he goes on to say, paragraph 20 C, 23, this case also required the court in parallel to address the problems of insidious, indirect or intersectional forms of discrimination. Ray, could we move on, please? So in essence, what um, Judge Pinto identified was, as he said, the true cause of the discrimination. And he was inviting the European Court to, of its own motion, effectively look at this case as a case of discrimination. And in so doing, uh, settle upon socioeconomic disadvantage or poverty as being a ground of discrimination through the Article 14 other status route. Now that option obviously wasn't taken up by the court, hence it was a minority or a dissenting judgment. But look at what he says in paragraph 40. The court has rarely persisted to this extent in disregarding the fundamental issues raised by a case before it. And it seems to me that does go to the heart of the issue here. What this whole discussion about socioeconomic disadvantage in the context of discrimination is about, is about identifying not necessarily the only or even the most important cause of discrimination in an individual case, but a cause and an important cause of discrimination in an individual case. I think it's also important to note, don't worry that the files moved on, that the way in which it was framed by Judge Pinto was very much to focus on this idea of stigmatization again. Um, the form of discrimination that was being looked at was this idea that people were being uh, prejudiced and stigmatized simply because they were poor, which is perhaps a slightly different question uh, about the question of, of, of structural discrimination and how poor people become poor in the first place. And that's something I'll, I'll, I'll develop a little later on. But just to finish this, this, this piece about what's going on sort of internationally, uh, uh, there are a lot of other states which have now formally recognized um, some form of socioeconomic disadvantage as a ground of discrimination. Um, on, a, on a 2016 review of European countries plus five others, 20 of the 27 were found to have done something. Constitutions of South Africa, Bolivia and Ecuador have done something similar. Uh, since actually looking at this, I've realized that Canada, or sorry, Ontario and Quebec have done something similar. The United States obviously has not. Um, and Equinet, which is, a, which is a, an NGO that looks at kind of European standards of discrimination, have said that there has been litigation, albeit not a huge amount, or at least it varies from country to country, on these issues. And it has focused on issues like the fields of employment, social services, 
public and private housing and healthcare, etc. So other countries are doing it. So why aren't we doing it here? So again, Ray, can we move on? And I've just given some examples there of the kind of language that has been used in particular countries. I won't dwell on that just now, Ray, if we could move on. So the Equality Act 2010. So as we know, social economic status is not a class, it's not a tenth protected characteristic, um, but there is something of socioeconomic disadvantage in the Act, albeit not currently enacted or enforced, I should say, which is section one, which is the socioeconomic due regard duty. And section one, subsection one says, well, what it says there, an authority to which this section applies, which importantly includes central and local government or ministers and local government, must, when making decisions of a strategic nature about how to exercise its functions, have due regard to the desirability of exercising them in, in a way that is designed to reduce the inequalities of outcome which result from socioeconomic disadvantage. And explanatory notes state that the aim of this provision was to reduce inequalities associated with socioeconomic disadvantage that could include inequalities in education, health, housing, crime rates, or other matters associated with socioeconomic disadvantage. So this is the, the well-known fact that people who are in low-income groups tend to find that they have much less access to uh, high standards of education, high standards of healthcare, are more likely to be involved in the criminal justice system, etc. It's important to note perhaps that subsection 1.6 excludes disadvantages or inequalities that result from people being subject to immigration control, which is obviously unfortunate because such persons, as we know, are one of the most severely disadvantaged groups on the basis of socioeconomic um, metrics, at least. So what about section one? Well, the Labour government guidance at the time was clear that section one would not result in any resource expenditure at all. It wouldn't involve any additional resource, resources, which tells you just how nervous the Labour government even then was about introducing this measure. Lord Lester of Herne Hill, of course, was very heavily involved in, in the enactment of the Equality Act 2010, thought the, the, the provision was simply too vague to be enforced uh, and, and was not a fan of it. And then Matt Hancock said this in 2010, I apologise that Harriet Harman got her equalities laws through. This government is going to have an awful lot of problems. These are things we're going to have to move on, move on to in the future. Um, so a bit of a giveaway there about how Matt Hancock certainly saw equality law, uh, at least in 2010. And in due course, of course, the coalition government said as much and said that Section 1 not only wouldn't be uh, entered into force, but would be repealed because it would place unnecessary or disproportionate burdens on business, even though, of course, the duty didn't apply to businesses at all, but only public authorities. But now the situation, I think it's fair to say, is different. The duty is in force in Scotland uh, through the devolved administration's um, powers, and there is growing support elsewhere. The UN committees, perhaps unsurprisingly, but the Equality and Human Rights Committee, the Joint Committee of Human Rights, and, uh, and others have called for its enactment. And many local authorities have actually adopted it voluntarily. There is now a campaign called um, Hashtag One for Equality, which I'm proud to say just fair uh, instigated a couple of years ago and is now developing real momentum. And Just Fair has also conducted research, which interestingly showed that those local authorities who had voluntarily adopted the duty believed it allowed them to do two related things. One which was to actually drive financial efficiencies by helping it to identify how money could help reduce inequalities inefficiently and also help justify resource prioritization. In other words, you know, reading between the lines, councils were able to say, to their council leaders, look, it's not necessarily about meeting the needs who, of those who shout loudest, it's about going out and ensuring that we're addressing real disadvantage and real economic and uh, uh, cultural and social disparities, uh, rather than necessarily meeting the, 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 the needs of those who, as I say, were perhaps having um, the closest and most proximate relationship with their councillors, etc., who might not always be those, those same groups. And indeed, the duty uh, was a driver for these local authorities to go out and actually speak to people who were affected by these inequalities and find out what they thought would be likely to be the most beneficial in terms of addressing that disadvantage. And it seems to me that there's not much more that really needs to be said about Section 1. It's clear that even a non-prescriptive due regard duty like Section 1 can enhance transparency, engagement, democracy and engagement again, just for good measure, sorry for the typo. Um, and it's also perfectly viable. I mean, it's clearly a duty that could be operated, whether or not at additional cost, uh, and it would work very well alongside 
the PSED due regard duty and other impact assessment duties such as are contained in the NHS Act, for example. And just as an example of, of how it might have practical utility were it to be in force, uh, see the EHRC's inquiry to the Grenfell Tower uh, disaster, which was um, focused or orientated around Section 1 as if it were in force. So just moving on, that's all I'm going to say about Section 1, because basically I think the case is unanswerable that it should be brought into force. I would say that because, you know, just for has been at the forefront of that campaign, as I say, but I'd be very interested to hear other people's views if they disagree with me. OK, so just moving on now to whether or not there should be a 10th protected characteristic and just make some obvious points. We're clearly out of sync with not only international law, but emerging international practice. In any event, a human rights approach would be inadequate. It would only apply to public authorities. There would be no horizontal effect. It wouldn't apply to private individuals uh, and would also also only apply when substantive convention rights are engaged in the way that all the Article 14 jurisprudence has developed. I think it's important to note that, you know, although status grounds are a strong indicator, or existing status grounds, I should say, are a strong indicator of socioeconomic disadvantage, without having a tent protected characteristic, the obvious point is we potentially leave some people unprotected. And, and a good example, perhaps, is the very uh, important and um, groundbreaking case taken by Shelter last year, which found in the county court that landlords who were refusing to accept tenants who were dependent on housing benefit were acting unlawfully under the Equality Act, uh, as a form of direct discrimination, sorry, indirect discrimination against people um, on the grounds of sex or disability. But of course, these landlords who were operating these no DSS provisions uh, were preventing anybody from renting their properties. Uh, and the, the case that was taken by Shelter, admirable as it was, effectively offered no protection to those people who didn't show the protected characteristic of sex or disability. So why don't we have it as a temp protected characteristic? Well, there are at least four technical reasons that the uh, commentary suggests would mean that it would be not advisable to have uh, 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 class or socioeconomic disadvantage as a temp protected characteristic. I'm going to deal with these very, very quickly because I can't pretend to have resolved all of them to even my satisfaction, never mind yours. But let's just have a quick think about what they are. The first is that the class is just indeterminable. Uh, and I think this one is, is simply not tenable. Uh, there are various means by which social origin or class can be identified sufficiently well, consistently is identified indeed by sociologists and other for, for different purposes. Uh, the LSE's seven classes that are reasonably well known, for example, that range from elite to the precariat are all well established and evidence based and, and could be adopted by the courts if it weren't for uh, there, there may be some, some, some better identifiers that could be used. And also, I think it's important to say that disability, religion and race are similarly not you know, definitively, definitively defined and that doesn't prevent them from being perfectly well-functioning protected characteristics. The second argument you know, is, is perhaps a, a slightly more profound one, which, which, which says this, that poverty as such or socioeconomic disadvantage is not immutable. People move in and out of it. But again, I think that's just not tenable when one looks at the evidence. Birth and background dictate outcomes in liberal democracies. We know this despite the rhetoric, the evidence is there. Uh, little more needs to be said about it. And indeed, the extra efforts that one must undertake to overcome, as it were, one's class as a form of disadvantage in itself. The, the third one is that it's too broad or misdirected. Now, some of the criticisms here come from people who would rather see a closely, tightly focused um, uh, ground of discrimination like class, not something as broad as socioeconomic disadvantage. They also point to the fact that if it is just socioeconomic status um, or social origin, that might also allow people of higher income thresholds, et cetera, to utilize the provisions, you know, to access things like private member club, et cetera. Again, I don't really think there's much in any of these objections. Um, you know, it's clear that the protection would have to be asymm asymmetric in some degree. You'd have to protect people, obviously, in the uh, uh, lower incomes or, 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 or lower classes, as it were. And, you know, we'd have to, as, as the Arcescar uh, general comment says, engage with both the question of, of origin and inherited social conditions and also current material conditions when looking at how we would form the status. And then the final one, which clearly does have some relevance is non-justiciability. And, and, and it's a nuanced point, but effectively it comes down to this, that the courts would be, wouldn't be in a position to try and affect remedies to deal with socioeconomic disadvantage because it would necessarily engage questions of socioeconomic policy and they're not really matters for the courts. Well, that's true to an extent, as we know, and we've already seen through the article 14, jurisprudence and there would obviously be limits in that regard and, and an important point is the 
is the, the, the principle that was established in the H. and Ealing case, which is that even if you manage to establish that a particular um, policy practice or criterion causes uh, direct or in, uh, sorry, indirect discrimination, it may well nevertheless be justified by reference to other associated measures. And so one could easily see how if one wanted to pull out a particular piece of tax policy that was said to be, uh, for example, indirectly discriminatory against poor people, the government would be able to justify it perhaps by pointing to its welfare um, forms or its social security system or something of that nature. So would we really be able to get any penetration? And I think that's a good point, but I also think it applies probably equally when trying to address things like systemic race discrimination or systemic sex discrimination in society. They will rub up against these big questions of socioeconomic policy. It's up to the courts to work, work that out. So just moving on, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I've been going on a while, so I'm going to try and move to my conclusions as quickly as I can. So another big objection, well, is it an objection really, or a concern, I think is a better way of putting it, is, is would we lose something if we had um, socioeconomic disadvantage or class as a tenth protected characteristic. You know, if we were to focus on poverty or social deprivation, will we somehow become blind to the inherent racism, sexism, or ableism that is also present? Keeping in mind that people who share those protected characteristics may be disproportionately more likely to also share the protected characteristics of, of, of social disadvantage, and indeed may face additional social disadvantage. Uh, uh, there may be some additional costs associated with, with, with um, their, their sharing those other protected characteristics. And I think obviously that is a legitimate concern, but is it inevitable we would somehow lose our ability to, to, to um, address that, those forms of discrimination? I think it's doubtful. Uh, I mean, I, I wonder whether or not the opposite is true, that if we had a more complete understanding of the interaction between various forms of discrimination, that would actually enhance protection, particularly for those who face multiple simultaneous forms of discrimination that may be inseparable. Uh, by assuring that by ensuring that the causes are all properly actioned and, and understood. I also think when you look at it the other way, that increased awareness of structural forms of racism and the patriarchy, etc., is actually driving us to a better understanding of how society is also inherently anti-poor. You know, kind of uh, it, it's, a, it's a, an almost um, inevitable, but but not necessarily wanted uh, or intended consequence of of having status-based discrimination. That the deeper we go into those issues, the more we become conscious of how class and socioeconomic disadvantage is also at play. There's also, I think, perhaps a broader question about whether we might foster greater solidarity if we were able to um, <clears throat> ensure that those repeatedly subjected to socioeconomic disadvantage were able to assert their rights collectively, irrespective of status. And I think COVID-19 may, may be an interesting example of that. Um, you know, we've seen rightly a lot of focus on the fact that, that people who are black or minority ethic have been subjected to a disproportionate levels of adversity because um, or, or, or th of the pandemic, including mort mortality rates. But as that is being better understood, we're realizing that to some extent that may be explained, only to some extent, but it may be explained by issues about social deprivation, poor housing and overcrowding, and indeed vocations. Uh, and that's an important part of that analysis and understanding how it is that, that uh, COVID-19 and the response to it is having a disproportionate impact uh, not only people who share protected characteristic of race, but also people who are in the lower income bands in any event. And also there's just this question about remedies. You know, the, the, there's this evidence which suggests that the uh, uh, minimum wage legislation actually helped narrow to some extent um, the gender pay gap, albeit it didn't explain why women were disproportionately more likely to be in low pay um, um, jobs than men were. So conclusions. Um, very, very quickly, socioeconomic disadvantage is a form of disadvantage or misdistribution that is often but not always the consequence of status discrimination, but it's also often the cause of discrimination in and of itself. I think few people actually need convincing that class or social status grounds discrimination in individual cases, stigmatization, social, social exclusion, the prejudice are experienced by people because of their inclusion, real or perceived in an identifiable low income group all the time. And I think I think we all experience it and, and we all witness it. I think we also probably understand that classism in, 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 that, in that sort of sense is distinct, if not unconnected to other forms of status-based prejudice, or at least potentially is, and we need to explore the circumstances uh, and the reasons why that is so. Uh, and perhaps more controversial is whether structural inequalities are a consequence of discrimination. Are poor people as a group subjected to adverse treatment, or are people poor for independent reasons that disclose no disparate treatment, i.e. the sort of classic liberal objection that being poor is not an immutable state of affairs, 
and therefore class or socioeconomic status is not really a discrete group at all. I think that if there is anything in that, it can't possibly be any answer to classes, classism in the more sort of narrow prejudice-based sense that has been the focus really of the international uh, institutions was the, the focus of Judge Pinto's analysis to some extent. And it's probably the kind of the, the more likely terrain for us to develop um, class-based discrimination norms. Um, but you know, the broader question is, is society sort of inherently classist in that the preservation of existing vertical inequalities has become a critical part of its functioning, at least in its current constitutional form. This is the structural question. And this potentially would engage socioeconomic relationships with power in a way that the courts have simply seldom grappled, which is of course entirely unsurprising in the absence of individual socioeconomic rights. Uh, and maybe unavoidable nevertheless. Uh, and I, you know, I think one has to accept that, you know, we are not going to see, you know, our class-based discrimination make up for, for example, the, uh, the diminished state of, of organised labour in, in, in the UK, which has also accompanied a lot of those social changes that I was setting out at the beginning um, of this talk. Uh, but it might do something. But what we are clear about is that merely adding class as a temp protected characteristic would not of itself be enough. We'd certainly want to add the due regard uh, duty in section one, and even that would probably be insufficient. So that raises a question of, is there anything else we can do? And on that far more difficult question, I hand over to you, Lady. Right, I think I better learn how to unmute myself before I attempt to say anything. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I wanted to say for starters that my approach to much of this, um, and indeed my approach to anything I'm asked about in terms of the transformative potential of law has been um, one that recognizes that law can do so little sometimes. And perhaps that's the wrong approach to take to a seminar of this kind, but I, I want to start from that point of view, at, at least recognizing um, what 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 the difficulties are in trying to address something as entrenched as 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 also a structural disadvantage or discrimination of any sort um, purely through the mechanism of, of of legislative change but anyway let's see how we go um, the first thing I wanted to say in principle is that why would we want to think about the two things together, the two things that Jamie and I are talking about? Jamie's talking about, um, obviously, classism, class discrimination, socioeconomic disadvantage, and I'm talking about how combined discrimination provisions or anti uh, provisions which deal with combined discrimination might help. And I just wanted to outline, first of all, why we see these things as possibly linked. And the, the first of the reasons is that if the point of equality law, which I would say it ought to be, is to transform and address stubborn structural and unjust impediments to human flourishing, then that's a reason to look at um, class and combined discrimination. And also, if the aim of equality law is to identify as practical practically and accurately as possible, those patterns of group disadvantage, which are historical, substantial, pervasive and abiding, that tells you why you also want to look at those two things together. And in order to do uh, the two first, the first bullet points I point to or I raise, um, both of those things require a proper appreciation of the complex ways in which inequalities are produced, maintained, experienced, and endured. And I, um, I, I've, I've cited in particular two authors that I've had a look at, uh, perhaps not as closely as I would have liked for the, in preparation for this, but who have really helped me to think through some of the things I wanted to say today, and that's, um, that's uh, uh, Atri. And uh, of course, later on, I refer to Bora. And I, I, if I mispronounce those names, I, I hope I'll be forgiven. So that's the, can I, Ray, would you help me with the next slide, please? Yes, yeah, so, so, so continuing in the vein of why would we want to think about these things in combination, um, the next point is that class both describes a crucial relationship between those who 
have to work and the system in which they are paid in exchange for that work. And it is a powerful axis along which discrimination is experienced. And this touches upon something that Jamie raised. It, it seems to me that we might want to think about. And, and, and like Jamie says, I'm only just wanting to raise these issues uh, for discussion rather than seeking to present answers. But there's a difference, it seems to me, between discriminating, directly discriminating against somebody for reasons of class and uh, in the stigma sense, and the acknowledgement that any law intended, intended to transform society in some crucial way to do with structural disadvantage has to recognize the relationship, the, 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 the Marxist notion of class then. So that, and those are two different things and how, how that's addressed through equality law is, is I think the thing that Jamie's mentioning and, and that many people are trying to grapple with. But in any event, my last point on this thing on, on, on why we should look at them in combination is because neither class nor any other protected characteristic under the Equality Act um, operates in isolation. N neither of those things can diagnose the ways in which or the means by which markers such as disability, sexuality, gender, race or age interact to produce what many have described as an unequal society. Ray, please help me with the next slide. So this is where I thought that the question of in intersectionality comes in. And, and in some senses, intersectionality is thought about as a buzzword in today's world. We all, well, I hear it a lot, and I'm sure a lot of other people hear it a lot too. And there may very well be some misunderstandings of what it means. I mean, I think that the sort of poorer understanding of it ties it up to identity politics and, and, and treats it as something which which has, has, has decimated or destroyed the ability of um, societies to work together in coalition um, collectively, but, but rather fragments society. And the, so, so that's, that's a more sort of negative popular view. But what I was interested in looking at intersectionality for here is the way in which it might be able to help inequality law terms to address some of the issues that Jamie's raised. Um, since, of course, class doesn't act, operate in the abstract. And so that it, looking at things intersectional, in, intersectionally might help. So in terms of thinking of intersectionality as a conceptual tool or an analysis, it's, a, it's described um, by, uh, by proponents of intersectionality serious proponents as an analytical or political orientation developed largely in the context of black feminist and women of color theoretical and political traditions. And it, it approaches lived identities as interlaced and systems of oppression as enmeshed and mutually reinforcing. So one aspect of identity is not treated as separable or superordinate. The matrix contests single axis forms of thinking about subjectivity and power and rejects hierarchies of identity or oppression. And to break that all down for, for the purposes of equality law and, and thinking about the Equality Act, what, what, what that really goes to is the issue that many who were involved in the design of the Equality Act were trying to grapple with, which is this focus in traditional discrimination law on the single axis model, which is you're, dis you're discriminated on the basis of X ground because of or on the grounds of this. You prove that, and that's the axis. You can prove additional ones, but the same axis theory or single axis theory um, operates. And intersectionality, in a sense, steps into that or confronts it and says, but that isn't how it works. Discrimination works differently in the sense that there might be different aspects of disadvantage which mutually reinforce each other and the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So that's um, uh, where, where theoretically intersectionality starts from. Thanks, Ray. Next slide, please. Um, so I, I, can, I can rush through this slide fairly quickly because uh, uh, one of the things I think it's, it's, it's important to say is that it starts with, or this approach starts with the indivisibility of the way in which discrimination is experienced by individuals as members of groups that may be structurally disadvantaged. Um, 
So the, 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 the key to this approach, and sometimes it's confused with other approaches to multiple discrimination, and the key to this approach, it seems to me, is that it's not a cumulative or a mathematical formula. It's not you add them all up and, 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 and so you're profoundly discriminated against or strategically discriminated against, but it's more that at the intersection of these structural forms of disadvantage, there, there exists perhaps another qualitatively different form of disadvantage or discrimination that might be experienced um, at that intersection. But always one has to look at the context in which this occurs. Thanks, Ray. Next slide, please. So um, it, it, it look, importantly for this issue of class, I think what it does is it looks at more than a single so source causation. And it looks not at issues of particular protected characteristics or particular axes along which discrimination acts as, um, as hierarchical, or nor does it attribute uh, primacy to one particular one, but it recognizes uh, that these things happen in a particular context at a particular time in a specific situation. So moving on from there, thanks Ray. So, so, so just pausing there before I discuss the next slide, one of the reasons that I think it's helpful for thinking about the things that Jamie has mentioned is that there is, and I'll come on to this very briefly in, as I conclude these slides, there is a hesitance in discrimination law um, about addressing class. And I think if we look at the, the, the development of equality law in the UK, we might begin to see why that is, both in terms of the time at which the strides were made in the Equality Act, uh, and in a sense, maybe a recognition of the fact that discrimination law has to some extent always been reformist in its impulses. So that there is, there are two things happening, it seems to me. One is it, 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 attend, it intended, certainly by the time of the passage of the Equality Act to try and address those stubborn forms of discrimination, which were obvious and overt and um, perhaps the wider world at large could regard as odious, uh, into which class discrimination does not fall, unfortunately. So that's one thing. So it, it wants to address what it can address unobjectionably. So, the, the, and so that's one thing. Then the, the second thing to be aware of in this connection is that some of the proponents of the Equality Act, for example, with its which with, with its focus on the public sector equality duty and, and indeed to some extent a, a, a legislative provision which dealt with combined discrimination, which focused to some extent on this notion of intersectional discrimination that I'm mentioning. Those impulses, some of the people who wanted those things to happen appreciated at the time, I believe, that the, 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 there would be a problem of passage of the Equality Act if class were focused on explicitly. And that tells us about the political climate in which we lived even then and the political climate in which we may live now. But so, so, so in some senses, that's an explanation of the context in which I think this never, the, the, the class never was faced head on in this context in, in terms of domestic equality law. And, and whereas, Jamie says that in some senses, it was not the goal of equality law to uh, address socioeconomic disadvantage. Perhaps that needs to be sort of troubled a little bit because I think that there was a clear recognition that some, a lot of socioeconomic disadvantage existed because there was no facial um, uh, protection and for those who had suffered structural disadvantage on the grounds of the protected characteristics that are mentioned. But there was, a, in other words, I think those who were trying to usher in the Equality Act very much thought, and, and perhaps I'm being generous, very much thought that there, there was only so much that Parliament and the country could pallet at one time. Anyway, so, so, so just looking at the, moving on then to the question of the, the single axis approach, 
and what the problems are with it. In, 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 in large part, I think, I hope from what I've said so far, people, people recognize that one of the problems with the discrimination law, certainly in this country, was uh, very much demonstrated in the case of Baal that I mentioned, um, which was, Ray, can we go back for one, one slide for a moment? Um, which as many who are who have been involved in equality law may know was a case in which the the um, head of the law society Kamnish Baal at the time brought a claim in discrimination on the basis of her race and her sex and what the court of appeal did found in 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 in, in its conclusions was that um, if the employment tribunal was to find in her favor in this regard it had to find that she had proved her race discrimination case and proved her sex discrimination case and it was only on that basis that she could uh, if, if you like um, succeed she could not seek for example to adduce evidence from one particular one in relation to one ground um, and use it for the other in order to bolster it and one of the things that uh, led to the campaign in a, in a sense, leading up to the Equality Act's passage for a combined discrimination provision was this sense that there was something unique about the complaint of a brown woman in this case, who was suggesting that she was discriminated against as a brown woman, um, uh, which wasn't captured by being invited to have to prove race or sex separately and being told as it was there that it would be surprising if the evidence for each form of discrimination was the same thanks ray next slide please um so the the i i i i'll leave you to read this in your own time but in one way this 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 case highlighted what it meant to disaggregate complaints which are based on a specific intersection or a, and a specific inter, inter, interplay of factors by forcing them into the single axis. And that's the point of the combined discrimination provision. Ray, can we move on to the next slide, please? So the, the, in, in some senses, the, the problem of single action, axis discrimination was acknowledged and actually was uh, sometimes dealt with by, and in, in this case, it was in, in the beak, it was dealt with by the EAT in rather a different way from the way it was handled in Baal by the Court of Appeal. But this was in 2010 before the passage of the Act, and then we got the combined discrimination provision, which I'll speak of. Next slide, please, Ray. So the combined discrimination provision was one which the Labour government um, in a sense committed itself to, but committed itself in a kind of rather weak way in some senses. Uh, it said that there were there was a need for a multiple discrimination provision and it, it highlighted in its consultation documents two kinds of multiple discrimination, additive and intersectional. And additive is what it sounds like, which is you have two types of discrimination meted out against you at the same time. Uh, in the context of the same incident and intersectional discrimination I've already described. So Ray, next size, slide please, sorry. Um, and interestingly, and, and I wanted to point to this in trying to address or trying to assist with the, with, with the issue that Jamie raised, um, uh, and it's this, it's that the government cho chose to limit the number of protected characteristics that could found a claim in combined discrimination to two. And I, I, I probably ought to say at this stage, this, this piece of legislative, um, this provision has never come into force. And I, I, I hardly expect that it's going to come into force now, considering it was never brought into force during the coalition government. Um, and and I, I, I would guess that the impulse to bring it into force is much, much reduced now. But in any event, one of the things to look at about it is that the government was even there concerned, and this is this is a provision that was never intended to address class, but the government was even there concerned about the burdens on business, and this was a Labour government, and it was concerned about the burden on business that would be created by having to look at two or more grounds um, or, 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 of potential discrimination. And it also suggested that it hadn't received any evidence that 
um, there are people who did suffer discrimination on more than two grounds. Now, the Discrimination Law Association, of which I was a member of the at the time, put forward that there were grounds, for example, of younger Muslim men, younger men of African, African and Caribbean ethnic origin. Uh, and, but to some extent, I, as Jamie says, that the, at the time there may have been a big anxiety around the burden on businesses caused by this provision and notionally by the socioeconomic disadvantage provision that the, the, the duty that Jamie talked about, uh, which, which meant that the approach of the government to try and get these provisions through in principle was to limit them as much as they could do. So, so the, um, one of the, the, the false things that was said in that context, of course, was that it would actually complicate the law. And one of the things I would say is that it, 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 it doesn't, and we see examples in South Africa about the way that it doesn't complicate the law. In fact, it elucidates the law and links it to real life experiences. And we see that in, 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 in cases and, and in the way that South African Constitutional Court analyzes some of these, these, th these kinds of cases. And I'll come to talk about one very briefly later on, which is Hassan. But so, this, these were the responses. These, this was the. These were some of the the, the the contentions of the government when it was bringing this the Labour government when it was bringing these provisions into force. Next slide, slide, please, Ray. Um, there was also a complaint that smaller organisations would have difficulty identifying comparators in the same or similar circumstances if claims were not limited to two grounds. And again, one of the responses of, of, of uh, interested and uh, informed stakeholders was that this ignored the evidential reality that in most discrimination cases, um, comparators are hypothetical and one creates a matrix of what the hypothetical, what the comparator would look like. Uh, so that such that the, you don't actually look for an actual comparator to each claim that it's made, you construct a set of circumstances in which the hypothetical comparator exists. So, so a lot of this was 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 in a sense directed at, at at trying, it seems to me, to to reduce the most radical aspects of this kind of pr provision, um, or, or 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 actually to or might have had the effect of stymieing the most radical aspects of these provisions. Um, and indeed, you, one can see that the use of comparators in discrimination cases can really bring to the fore what the actual discrimination is. Um, and that came up in the case of Hassam in South Africa, which I, uh, in the South African Constitutional Court, which was about polygamous marriage and inheritance. And the court looked at sociological evidence, it looked at, it, it, it looked at a series of different comparative circumstances in order to narrow down the basis on which the discrimination occurred. And it found that it occurred on three grounds by looking carefully at that. So it's not, it's not impossible to do this at all. And it doesn't actually have to cost more because in some ways, if uh, employers or other authorities are actually looking at what, uh, ha have proper pre preventative measures in relation to any particular characteristic, looking at them in combination shouldn't be a problem. So the, what, what I, I think I've highlighted this section 14 to suggest is that it's, it, it was already tentative and it never came into force, but it, the, insofar as it began to indicate a legislative interest in intersectionality, that is what might be useful for dealing with issues of class. Ray, thank you very much. Next slide, please. So that's the provision. And I won't go into that in detail. You can look at that in your own time. It's there in the act. And I doubt, the, I doubt whether there'll be the will to bring it into force. But the notion of intersectionality that it actually re reflects to some extent is an important one. Going forward to the next slide, please, Ray. Um, th th there were many problems with the section 14, as I have already, already outlined, but the and I think I've discussed those two elephants in the room. 
um, and all, already that it, for example, in the to, to the extent that it focused only on direct discrimination, it would not have captured it into ways in which there were combined as discriminatory or combined forms of discrimination that operated in terms of indirect discrimination or harassment. It was only ever intended to deal in it as past with direct discrimination. Next slide, please, Freddie. And the, uh, the, the, there were problems with the way it approached comparators in that the comparators were restricted to person to a person who had neither of the protected characteristics, which isn't a way that direct discrimination necessarily worked in, re in relation to single access discrimination uh, under the Equality Act. But as I say, all of these were measures that I would like to, to describe as anxious uh, on, on the part of the legislators who was trying to get this, this, um, this particular provision through. So, so there were problems, but it, but, it, but it hit on something that I think could help. And that is the, 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 the recognition that sometimes discrimination compounds, the, the different forms of structural disadvantage compound and co-influence each other and produce a, a, a different species of discrimination altogether. Next slide, please, Ray. So um, the, uh, it seems to me that if we understand intersectionality as an, an approach, then it, we have got to see that it is, it is profoundly useful for pinpointing how discrimination or inequality is experienced and how it operates. And if it does so, then it always, it seems to me, must be thinking about class. Because we, I mean, I think in life generally, we, and, and as Jamie has highlighted to some extent, we all know that in, in a sense, the, the most, um, the, the, some of the most abject um, evidence of discrimination will present itself in the context of socioeconomic disadvantage. So it, it, it seems to me that if you have an approach that is looking at how realities or how lives are actually lived and how things work, how power works, it's got to look at class in that sense. Um, so it's, it, and, and, and one, an intersectional approach which doesn't look at class would have to be one that is only interested in what I sometimes uh, have heard others and I, I myself refer to as a, as a sort of liberal diversity agenda, which is to sort of add um, uh, representatives of particular racial groups or minority racial groups or add uh, women, add disabled persons and think that, that, that in doing so, one addresses issues of structural disadvantage and systemic inequality. It is only if one looks at equality law as simply creating that nice kaleidoscope that one leaves class out of the equation in my view, and this is looking forward. So any kind of intersectional understanding of the categories of difference cannot exploit its transformative potential by delinking the socioeconomic from the gendered, sexualized, and racialized way in which the in which socioeconomic positioning is lived. Next slide, please, Ray. So where that leaves us is that um, uh, in this, where that gets me to anyway, is that if there are grounds of discrimination in an equality law statute or paradigm, then there is in principle, little justification for socioeconomic disadvantage or class not being one of them. And I agree in, 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 in broad terms, I think, uh, with what Jamie was saying is that we can argue about the semantics of how class is described, whether it's social origin, whether it's socioeconomic disadvantage, whether it's status, et cetera, but taking account of the, the materiality of class position in relation in, 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 in an equality statute can't be impossible uh, conceptually. The political will is a different thing, but conceptually it can't be possible and I, I'm impossible. And the thing that strikes me most about this as well is that 
to some extent, we, 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 there may be, and there, there ought to be a specific understanding of why it was felt that categories uh, or groups, protected groups such as uh, uh, race or patterns of disadvantage based on race, sex, disability, sexual orientation needed to be recognized um, prominently. Whilst we can understand why that is necessary, we also have the concomitant understanding that those things that are described as immutable um, and, and they have material effects. It's, it's not so much that, for example, in the case of race, it's not so much that race is about something you can't change that makes it, has it have its effect. I, I think that's a common, common approach to this, to explain why anti-race discrimination provisions are important. But in fact, one of the reasons that race is, it's important to think about race discrimination is not that it's, in, it, it's, it's immutable as, and it's about skin color, et cetera, and something that you're born with, but it's more that it has meaning in society in that it has come to have that meaning because of the history of colonialism, et cetera. Um, and, and the way in which, um, race was given meaning. And that is why it has continued to have the structural impact it has. And the same can be said, it seems to me, of class. Um, so so that's, that, that's uh, in my view, a good reason why class should find its way into an equality statute. But the, the other thing to mention about this is that I, um, for example, am quite conscious of the, the problem of simply trying to use the Equality Act, for example, to, to add class as a 10th um, ground. And on the basis that what you're trying, what one is interested in there is prohibiting a certain kind of stigma discrimination at the point of employment or the point of provision of services. Um, that is important. But to me, what is much more important is where is the way the way class socioeconomic status operates to disadvantage um, uh, at the point of any the experience of any other form of disadvantage because I, I for example don't see class as undifferentiated there is it's any kind of even class discrimination is always experienced in the particular circumstances of the person concerned so there isn't a homogeneous working class um, so that class could just be added to the list of qualifying requirements. It is experienced uh, in the context of other forms of identity. So some thinking needs to go into, it seems to me, the way in which class might be incorporated into an equality law provision. Next slide, please, Ray. Um, and so Jamie touched on this, so I won't say much more about it. And, 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 and but the, the, there is a question about what we mean by class in this connection. And I think it must be clear that we mean social class and we're not talking simply about the ownership uh, or the lack of ownership of the means of production. We're talking about the signifiers that come with what we call class these days, um, which might be some people talk about as being social capital, cultural capital and economic capital. I, I myself, not too happy about talking about people as capital, but, but I know that's quite common to do now. Um, the, so, so, so that's the sort of issue I think I, I would want to focus on in thinking about how class finds its way into e equality legislation. Um, and uh, the last bullet point on this slide is something that I, I think I alluded to or even said earlier, which is that one needs to recognize the Equality Act for what it was. It was an important piece of legislation, but it was also a piece of liberal legislation. And in this sense, I, I don't necessarily mean liberal in the way that it's often regarded as being progressive. I mean that it's it's not a it, it wasn't a piece of legislation that was going to achieve major transformation in many areas, although it has done in in in, in quite a few. It was mainly concerned with, apart from the PSED and the socioeconomic duty, which never came into force, concerned with offering individuals post hoc redress for over discriminatory treatment and, and bringing and harmonizing all of the different piece, pieces of disparate legislation we have into, in, in, ha, we had into one piece of, 
uh, into one statute. So it, in, in a sense, in one view, its aims might be seen as having been quite modest. Next slide, please, Ray. Um, so the, the, what, to close, what I would say is this, there is, a, I think, an unfair assumption that one of the problems with equality law is due to this focus on intersectionality and the, due to the focus on identity politics. And I think that that is a mistake. And it's a mistake because I think it's only intersectionality that can help to deal with the issues that we're talking about, about this unrecognized and misrecognized socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, in some senses, um, the way that internet intersectionality or the notion of intersectionality or multiple discrimination has been talked about in equality statutes or in law has missed something that is very, very present in the the development of inter intersectionality as a political project or as an activist project or as a theoretical project. And, and it's very, very linked to the class positions of those who, for example, found themselves out with equality provisions, formal equality provisions, you know, whether it be migrant women workers or black women in employment, which is what led to the, the, the coining of the phrase by Kimberly Crenshaw. It, 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 it was very, very class focused in its genesis. So there's no reason why it ought not to be class focused when it's used in the legal context. I think the, re, the, 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 the fact that it has been widely taken up by a sort of soft diversity and inclusion agenda, which doesn't pay attention to class, does not mean that it ought to be abandoned. And it's something that I think can be very, very helpful here. And so that's, in a sense, all I'm able to say by way of starting. And I think I, I have to, to end my talk there and say that I think this may very well be um, a intersectionality as a concept is, is a way, way forward and it's a way of uh, doing some of the thing that I think Jamie was referring to earlier, which is it, 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 it offers an opportunity for looking at precisely how disadvantage occurs. That might itself offer solidarity because if we look at, for example, tradespeople working in a particular context and we acknowledge, for example, that that particular demographic involves people from a particular ethnic minority group, uh, that may allow people who are tradespeople who also work in that, who are not a member of the group, to, to have a sense of solidarity with those who are overrepresented in that group. So this is, this is I think, a, a really useful tool, and it may be the only tool that there is in the context of equality law as we now know it. But I think that's all I've got time for. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Jamie and, and uh, Yuleli, for um, two uh, extremely thought-provoking presentations. Um, I would, uh, we, we've only got a few minutes left. I think we've already overrun our time. I don't want to take up uh, too many people's time, but um, the, we've got on, on questions and answers, I think we've got um, one comment. Um, I don't know if you can see it, Jamie and, and Yuleli. Um, it's from Saika Naz, who, who says, uh, a mental health professional who worked in some of the most deprived communities in the country. Uh, some of us are trying to, to raise awareness of their needs and needs of our white working class community being overlooked otherwise. It says people from poorer backgrounds have poorer physical and mental health. Uh, I'd love to see SES as a tenant characteristic, some of the problems we see are preventable. Um, I, I don't know if you, either of you have any, any reflections on that or whether Saika would want to, to add to that. Um, Jamie? No, you go. If you're ready to say something, go. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't really have a great deal to say about this, except to say that, I mean, that's, that's kind of one of the reasons I, I, I think that we're, we're focused on this. But I mean, I, I think um, uh, it, it may be that this is, this, is, this is why I think that it is useful to think through these things in terms of 
of socioeconomic disadvantage, and it allows uh, it allows a sense of dealing with some of these issues um, where where they are thought to apply more evenly across the po population. Some of these problems. I mean, it seems to me at the moment all I all I would say at the moment is that in in the sense of um, raising awareness of, of, of needs in relation to mental health. If one was looking at how to deal with it at present, one, all one, what one could try and do is look at the relationship between, in, in equality terms, between disability, you, d disability um, use disability as a way in. But yes, I mean, obviously, in, in so far as poverty itself gives rise to mental health problems, that is one of the reasons I think we're, we're we're wanting to talk about this and look at it and try and see what we can do about it. Yeah, I mean, I was only going to add that it's a sort of paradigm example that the example uh, provides. Um, and thanks for the contribution. I mean, to an extent, you know, the, 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 the underlying issue is potentially an absence of resources going into mental health and, and um, uh, community provision, which we're all familiar with. Uh, how do we use discrimination law to change that? Uh, and it seems to me that you, you know, arguably you could try to do that through the prism of uh, race discrimination if, if uh, people of certain ethnicities were um, uh, disproportionately likely to be suffering that particular disadvantage. Uh, but whether or not that would give you the kind of um, f factual and legal analysis you would need to make a significant uh, kind of... Um, intervention in the resource allocation decisions that are being made is perhaps more debatable. And why, why I say that is because one of the problems that seems to me may be a consequence of, of, of the act as it, as it now stands, and as Yuleli has very carefully explained how the more radical aspects of it were kind of stripped out of the act really, is that there would be a way in which you could imagine the resource decisions that are being made in that context could be justified by other, other steps that are being taken to try and address, for example, um, disadvantages being experienced by BAME communities in the area of, of the country that you're, you're talking about, which, which might be said to, to fail to, to grapple with the underlying issue, which is that why is this area as poor as it is in the first place? Why is it experiencing these levels of social deprivation in the first place? What can be done at a sort of macro level to address that? rather than looking at the discrete question of why certain groups are disproportionately represented within that community in the first place. And it, that may be an overly ambitious uh, uh, um, uh, 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 or optimistic hope, but I think it would at the very least require the evidence to try to address some of those issues. Uh, and it might be that we could see um, a, a slightly more, uh, um, I mean, effective is a strong word, but certainly an analysis which is just a, penetrates into the real problems a little bit more. Um, uh, whether or not there's, a, there's another issue which you've raised about uh, not being able to then secure almost as it were equal treatment for white communities, I, I don't know. I mean, I think this idea of the white working class is not necessarily something which is backed up by the evidence particularly well. Uh, you know, I think it's, a, it's something I'm a bit um, dubious about, but I can sort of understand how it's manifested as a phenomenon in circumstances where perhaps we have for too long uh, not looked at socioeconomic disadvantage as being a consequence of broader, broader discrimination grounds than is currently the case. But you know, that, that's about as far as I think I could take it. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much for both of you. Mike has added uh, a comment that um, uh, she's the uh, chair of the equality group for the British Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Psychotherapies and um, uh, suggests the, the possibility of continuing this conversation. Um, obviously, I, I can't speak for Jamie or Yulele, but um, I expect the answer may be a, a, a yes. Yeah, well, um, certainly, and I, I will actually um, email, send a message to her separately, as I'm sure Jamie would. Yeah. Yeah, and just to, to repeat what we said at the beginning, I mean, Eulalia and I both felt um, very kind of, uh, well, certainly I did, very humbled by the nature of these issues, and I can't pretend to have got my head around the small complex aspects of it sufficiently well to give a clear view, but, you know, I very much hope that next year we'll be 
do something more on this, that we have had the time to really think about it a bit more deeply. And as I said, we'll bring in others who've also been doing this for some time, because this is not a completely new idea by any stretch of the imagination, although there does seem to be some considerable momentum behind it at the moment. Um, and indeed, I think some of the inadequacies in the Equality Act at, through the anniversary um, is something that we should all be focusing on in, in the normal way in any event. So hopefully next year we'll be able to present a, a more complete picture with a, with a deeper dive into some of these more difficult questions. Uh, and, and hopefully some of you will be able to join us uh, as and when. So we'll, we'll, we'll be sure to keep you informed. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, unless there are any other questions uh, and, and none have uh, come up, if you've got a question, then uh, pop it in the question and answer. Uh, but uh, I mean, we, we've been going for some time now, so I think unless anything pops up immediately, I'm uh, going to close this session. But before I do formally, um, it, it's just a follow on, really, from what Jamie's just said about continuing the, the discussion. Uh, the, the next of our um, talks in this series um, is on Wednesday, the 16th of December, uh, which is um, entitled Queering the Equality Act. Um, and uh, we, again, we've got a, an excellent range of speakers um, who, among other things, are gonna be reimagining uh, key Equality Act 2010 judgments from an intersectional queer perspective. So that's uh, uh, taking uh, the debate we've had here um, into uh, a particular detail. Uh, in addition to that, um, can I draw your attention to an event this Thursday, that's 10th of December, uh, when one of our associate tenants, Professor Geraldine Van Buren, um, is going to be giving a lecture um, at the British Institute of In International and Comparative Law. Uh, and the title is, um, Do We Need to Prohibit Class Discrimination? Uh, so that will um, further develop uh, some of the discussions we've had today. Uh, it's at four o'clock at the Institute of International and Comparative Law. Um, you, you have to book on, on the line and, and the, the link to do that is on the Institute website. Um, but uh, just with those uh, two announcements, unless uh, Jamie and you have got anything else they want to, to add, can I um, thank you? Well, all? I did want to ask you a question, Martin. Did you? Yes. <laughs> well, no, which is related to, the, to some of the issues we've, we've been discussing. And is this from a sort of public law um, legislative, legislative point of view? It, you, you know, th this is the problem. I mean, the elephant in the room is so huge, right? The, the, the whole point of being, a, a, of having this democratic choice of deciding whether you want a government that organizes itself in, 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 in a way which means that it confronts structural issues to poverty or one which believes in the opposite, for example, and thinks that way, the way you do deal with it is trickle down. I mean, to what extent do you think that there is one any appetite for what we're talking about um, legislatively, and 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 does that abut or hit up against the whole point of of choosing a form of governance between a kind of more conservative style and a more um, social welfare is social democratic, moving on towards a socialist style of government. I mean, is what we're talking about too much of that? Uh, I think the short answer is probably yes, um, I'm, I'm sorry to say. I, I, I think in terms of appetite, there's clearly no appetite at the moment. Um, and um, you know, if, if the, the, the relatively modest and, and you know, fairly toothless Section 1 um, couldn't get enacted, um, or, or brought into force, then it, it's hard to see that we're going to have um, a, a, anything stronger um, with, with, with direct um, implications in, in individual cases. Um, it's it, it, it's not obvious that that it that it, it, it does um, require uh, a. a or that it necessarily fits into the, the framework that you're describing uh, about, about the, 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 the two kinds of governance and government. Um, because we, you, you can see that the, the appeal of introducing um, some um, socioeconomic um, grounds um, is 
does cut across those 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 political yes um, because there is an extent to which that can be viewed as something that is not special pleading on behalf of minority groups exactly in general they're, they're, as a populist yeah, um, yeah it's a populist yeah yeah um but it's uh, it, it's it's something which um for well, I, 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 I can't see, I, I, I can't, I, I, I can't see the appetite for it at the moment. But, but it's, it's, we, yeah, we, if, if reform is going to come, it may come from a surprising direction. Um, mm. in, 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 well, perhaps we don't, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily expect. Yeah. Um, no, I James. actually think I, I, I'm slightly more. I mean, I, I'm optimistic, but also in some ways more deeply pessimistic because I, I don't actually think the legal changes we're thinking about could really address in a very serious way the underlying issues, not least because eventually the courts would find that they were being asked to resolve issues of political ideology fundamentally and, and they wouldn't do it and, and that they would end up performing some kind of reviewing function. But I think the other forms of um, class-based or, or social um, origin-based discrimination of the kind that has become much more kind of uh, widespread and also understood, the kind of snobbery that's taken such a more pernicious kind of element to it is something that you could imagine um, a government, even of a slightly more right-wing inclined um, position to be in favor of, at least to find themselves struggling to defend the status quo because nobody wants to be overtly supporting, if you like, even benign snobbery, as it were. They'd want to say that this was consistent with their agenda of equal opportunity. And the whole levelling up uh, agenda is one which is predicated upon being able to overcome some of those barriers. And I think what, what, what's much more of a risk in a way is that you could imagine a further set of reforms to the Act that purport to deal with, deal with some of these issues, but at the same time, um, protect the state from significant interventions by judges on questions of socioeconomic policy, safe in the knowledge that the judges were going to be very unlikely to do that in any event. So you could perhaps start to see, you know, um, people being denied jobs on the basis of where they live or their accent being actionable, but you're not likely to see um, a, 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 a group claim being bought by a, a lot of people in low-income groups asserting that the government's um, spending review is discriminatory um, in the way that you did see, for example, with the Women's Budget Group and the, the no, sorry, the Fawcett Society and, and the, the, the George Osborne budget, um, because I think, you know, the courts would make sure that wouldn't go anywhere. So I, I think you could see it. I just don't necessarily think it's going to be sort of transformative in the way that we'd all secretly like it to. Um, and there's going to be no substitute for, for hard-edged politics in that regard. Uh, thank you. I, I, I see that our attendance, attendee list is, is dropping a little bit. Before we get to the stage where it's just me, Jamie and Yulili. Uh, <laughs> is points. That's so often to be the case. Just carry on. Yeah. Can, I, uh, can I ask you all um, to, uh, obviously the, the, the Yulili and Jamie can't hear you, but uh, it's just a, a virtual round of applause for their um, tremendous presentations. And, and thank you all for, for coming. And, and uh, I do hope that uh, some of you are going to be able to come to the other events. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.